First of all, as long as you're clapping, let's clap for uh, our incredible host, Dina and Nick, what they've done for us. We, we really can't thank you enough for what you've done for us, but what you've done for the world, the way you've opened up this place for so many good things. And I hope this is the beginning of a long friendship with you, and um, I'm sure many of us feel that way. It's obviously a great honor that Dennis asked me to share a few thoughts to help wind up this amazing few days, uh, an event that is just one manifestation of this kind of amazing global movement dedicated to the power and promise of sacred plants, this resurgence of research and practice and passion that is both profoundly hopeful and, of course, long overdue. You know, words like optimism and pessimism have been going around. Uh, we're often asked if we're um, optimistic or not. Well, I've always thought of pessimism as an indulgence, um, despair and insult to the imagination, orthodoxy, the enemy of invention. My father used to always say, do what you need to do and only then ask whether it was possible or permissible. And he was a kind of eternal optimist. And of course, optimism is in short supply these days. We live in challenging times, the lingering pandemic, the uh, horrific war in Ukraine, of course, the specter of climate change. But on truth be told, what generation has ever been born into a world free of troubles? You know, if you think about it, our grandparents and, and parents lived through true, true world wars in the Great Depression. People like Mark and Dennis and people our age uh, came of age in a decade marked by assassinations, um, an endless war in Vietnam, the prospect of global nuclear holocaust at, at all time. Um, but we also lived through some amazing things. Christmas Eve, 1968, when Apollo went around the dark side of the moon and emerged for the first time to see in human history not a sunrise or, or, or a moonrise, but literally the Earth itself ascendant, this blue orb floating, as the astronauts famously said, in the velvet void of space. And like some great wave of hope, the, that energy of illumination, only made possible by the brilliance of science, suddenly spread everywhere, almost immediately, we began to think in new ways. When we were kids, just getting people to stop throwing garbage out of a car window was in great environmental victory. Nobody spoke of the biosphere, biodiversity. Now those words are part of the vernacular of school children. Um, in little more than a generation, women have gone from the kitchen to the boardroom, people of color from the woodshed to the White House, gay men and women from the closet to the altar. Um, what's not to love about a world capable of not only such scientific brilliance, but such a cultural capacity for change and renewal? But curiously, when we look back on this kind of sea change, there's always one ingredient that's consistently expunged from the record, isn't there? Um, at least until recently, the, the singular fact that millions of us lay prostrate before the gates of awe, having taken some psychedelic. You know, I, I'm sure you all do this when you're giving public talks. You know, if you do them a lot, like Mark and Dennis and I do, you can almost be watching yourself at the podium. And sometimes I float above the podium and I'm thinking, how did that little boy from Montreal in that bourgeois suburb get to have such ideas? Um, I know I suffered from Baudelaire's malady, horror from home. I was desperate to escape a, 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 a kind of boring world in search of a kind of polychromatic world of authenticity. I live by Jim Whitaker's adage, you know, the first American to climb Mount Everest, who said, if you don't live on the edge when you're young, you're taking up too much space. And our beloved late brother, Terence, famously said that the great lesson of all the sages is that you jump off the edge and you don't land on rocks, you land on a feather bed. The world exists to lift you up, not to put you down. Um, but the truth of the matter is psychedelics were more than instrumental in my life. They didn't just crack open the sky, um, fling wide the windows of the mystic. They made me the person that I am. I wouldn't write the way I write. I wouldn't think the way I think. I wouldn't treat women the way I treat women. I wouldn't understand homosexuality. In fact, I have to tell you a quick story. 
Tim Plowman was coming out as a gay man when we were traveling together. I was 19. I came from logging camps. I didn't know what a homosexual was. He didn't really know what a homosexual was, but he was 30 and I was 19 and he fell in love with me. And this really got to be a problem. Uh, all you women who have had the proverbial, you love me, why don't you fuck me, um, you know what I was feeling. And, um, and uh, it was getting in the way and he was teaching me everything from yoga to botany to Spanish to everything. I didn't know what to do until we took this heroic whack of MDA together with my other buddy. And we were in the Sierra de la Macarena, naked, uh, looking out at this incredible place. And suddenly I'm looking at his body and I get closer and closer to his genitalia. And suddenly I look down at his flaccid penis and I start flipping it up with my hand. <laughs> and I say, is this all I'm afraid of? Is this all I'm afraid of? And I mean, I don't know. I don't know how much psychotherapy it would have taken a logger from British Columbia to come to that breakthrough. It didn't make me homosexual. It didn't make me necessarily even want to sleep with him. I just was no longer afraid. Um, uh, uh, but, um, but, but, the, but the point is, back, back then when our parents said to us, don't take these things, you'll never come back the same. They didn't understand that was the whole bloody point, right? <laughs> Uh, and so these substances really are transformative of lives. And, and let me just share one other revelation of science. It's kind of the moonshot of our children's generation. It too took part at the end of a long journey, but nothing in our experience has done more to liberate ourselves from the petty tyrannies and hatreds that have haunted humanity since the dawn of consciousness. Within our lifetime, genetics has proven the philosophers and the wise men and women to be correct. We are all brothers and sisters. And I don't mean that in the spirit of hippie ethnography. I mean quite literally, studies of the human genome have left no doubt whatsoever that the genetic endowment of humanity is a continuum. Biologically, race is a fiction. We're all cut from the same genetic cloth. We're all descendants of Africa, including those of us who walked out of Africa 65,000 years ago and then in 2,500 generations, 40,000 years, we carried the human spirit to every corner of the habitable world. But here's the important point. If we're cut from the same genetic cloth, it means all cultures share the same genius. And critically, whether this genius is invested in technological wizardry or in unraveling the complex threads of memory inherent in a myth is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation. There is no hierarchy in the affairs of culture. That old Victorian idea of an evolutionary development of humanity from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized of the Strand of London has been absolutely debunked by modern science, shown to be an artifact of the 19th century, no more relevant to our lives today as a notion of clergymen in that distant era who believed the earth was but 6,000 years old. In this stunning affirmation of the interconnectedness of humanity, genetics has bridged a gap between the natural sciences and the social sciences to prove the truth of Boaz's intuition about cultural relativism. And what this means is the other peoples of the world aren't failed attempts at being you. They're not failed attempts at being modern. Every culture is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer that question, they do so in the 7,000 different voices of humanity. And those voices, of course, and those answers become our, our repertoire. But this is what the anthropologists like Glenn have been saying forever. And, and Eduardo, Luis, every culture has something to say. Each deserves to be heard, just as none has a monopoly on the route to the divine. Well, my father wasn't a religious man, but he used to say, there's good and evil in the world, son. Take your side and get on with it. And there is great wisdom in that. We have this thing in the Judaic Christian tradition, the Christian thing especially, that good's going to sometimes vanquish evil. Ain't going to happen. You know, if you were a, a, a French Catholic in the 16th century and you asked the obvious question, if God's all powerful, why does he allow evil to exist? You were burned at the stake. But when Lord Krishna, in a very different context, was asked that very question, if God's all powerful, why does he allow evil in the universe? Lord Krishna said, to thicken the plot. In other words, good and evil march side by side. And the goal, of course, as Martin Luther King said, is to put our shoulders to the wheel of justice, 
knowing that the arc of history, as he said famously, does indeed bend ultimately toward the righteous. And I think that's what this psychedelic movement is all about. It's not, it's not about science. It's not about indulgence. It's not about, it's about the bloody transformation of the human spirit. And finally, we're going to come to understand that even this word indigenous is one of my least favorite words. It, it just perpetuates colonialism. It says that we're not indigenous and everybody here is indigenous. Well, it's ridiculous. There's 7,000 voices. We are just one little thread of cultural expression. So when I think of like Laurel's work, you know, and, and Joseph, you know, with San Pedro, healing the earth, this is the gift of these plants. You cannot take San Pedro without coming away with a deeper understanding of the wonder of the natural world. No politician should be able to go for office if they can't recite the formula for photosynthesis. Um, and, 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 and so, you know, how did we get it wrong? How did we get it wrong? Well, you know, we're not bad. We just made a mistake. You know, in our effort to liberate ourselves from the tyranny of absolute faith, um, we kind of threw out the baby with the bathwater. And when Descartes said that all that exists is mind and matter, in a single gesture, he swept away magic, mysticism, but critically, metaphor. And in time, as Saul Bellow said, science would make a house cleaning of belief. So the idea that the flight of a bird could have meaning was deemed to be ridiculous. And the world became a template upon which only the human drama existed. And that made a big difference. If I'm raised to believe that a mountain's a pile of rock ready to be mined, I'll have a different relationship to it than a kid in the Andes raised to believe it's an apudi that'll direct his destiny. Same thing with a forest. If I believe a forest is cellulose and bored feet, that's going to give me a different relationship than the kwakwakwak -kwak who believe that the forest is the abode of hukuk and the crooked beak of heaven and the cannibals. And it doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong, but the consequence is significant. We have this extractive model, and we think because of its ubiquity, its power, that it's the norm. It's the anomaly. Almost all cultures of the round, uh, world base their relationship with the natural world on, some, on reciprocity, some iteration of the idea the earth owes its bounty to people, people owe their fidelity to the world. So this idea, of, I've been thinking a lot lately about the sacred. What, what, what is the sacred? That's a word that's come up. Um, so much um, over the course of this, of this week. Um, you know, when I was a little boy, uh, I prayed every night in my bedroom in Montreal. I can still see my elbows at the open window in the cold winter air with the stars shining through the branches of the elm trees. It still um, populated the, the, the streets of old Quebec at that time. And I, and I conversed with a God whose presence um, could be felt and whose spiritual authority and omnipotence I accepted as an act of faith. Now my parents, broken by the war, never saw the inside of a church. And so I dutifully, at the beginning of the age of six, set off every Sunday on my own and continued to do so without fail for five years. I still have the little gold star badge that rewarded my attendance. And I didn't go to worship the building. I, I went like a pilgrim to the building to be in the presence of God, and for the longest time, um, he was always to be found. But as the years went by and I learned more and more about the world, there came a day when he simply failed to show. And I never again entered a church as a Christian believer. But when years later I returned to that small community as an adult, what astonished me most was to realize how well I had known it. Every blade of grass resonated with a story. Shadows marked the ground where trees had fallen in my absence. Uh, innovations and new constructions I took as personal insults, violations of something sacred that lay at the confluence of landscape and memory. And what I was feeling in that moment of return was not nostalgia, but rather a connection to the actual force that all of, for all of those years had propelled my spiritual yearning a numinous energy that I now recognize as being the essence of the sacred, the invisible presence that the French philosopher Henri Corbin described as the imaginal, a supersensory dimension that transcends religion, a space of intuition and revelation, impossible to describe, yet accessible to those in every culture who perceive the world, as he put it, 
through the eyes of the heart. My, my longings as a child, um, I realized, had not been of a religious nature, at least not in a formal sense. I'd been looking instead for a path that embraced the mystic amongst the multitudes, the promise of all people in all places through all time who had found peace and comfort in the, their pursuit of the divine. I came to see God as but a product of our desires. Our spirit and imagination transform an edifice of stone into a sacred space. A shrine is sanctified by the legacy of all those who have come before with their hopes and prayers and promises um, and fears. Relics, icons, chalices, um, uh, made as they are, simple objects, crosses crafted from wood, um, silver and bone, only take on resonance, spiritual resonance, over time, like, like old tools warm from decades of human touch. Sacrifice main, means to make sacred, and if the idea of the sacred is as old as humanity itself, as anthropologist Roy Rappaport suggests, then the sacred can never be divorced from human agency. We dream the sacred into being. Ritual is the ground from which it springs. The sacred only becomes manifest through the enactment of rituals that summon the spirit and give form to the divine. In Jerusalem, for example, as the Jewish people water the western wall with their tears and melt the stone with their kisses, they achieve spiritual clarity and purpose as God's eternal nation, his chosen people. In Haiti, there is a waterfall at Sodo that is home to Dambalewedo, the serpent god, and the source of all the rain and the repository of spiritual wisdom. And when the first rains fell, a rainbow was reflected, Aida Wedo, and their love entwined them in a cosmic helix from which all life was fertilized. And so once each year in the summer, tens of thousands of voodoo acolytes go to the waterfall and merely to touch the thin, cold blood of the divine is to become possessed by the serpent. And at any one point in time, you have hundreds of people slithering across the wet stones like snakes. This man has gone into the waterfall fully clothed, and like the snake that sheds its skin to be emerge renew, he will then be renew, renewed for the coming year. And if we slip for a moment into the mountains of Peru, the Sinicara Valley, for most of the year in the southern Andes, is home just to solitary shepherds and their <laughs> flocks. But for three days, as the Pleiades reemerge in the sky, it draws over 40,000 pilgrimages, pilgrims to the Coyariti, the snow, Star Snow Festival. Some arrive on foot, some in trucks, some carry the crosses of their communities high into the mountains where the crosses are brought up into the glaciers of the Colcaponca, implanted in the ice itself to absorb the energy of Pachamama that they can then be brought back down in the shadow of Ausangati, the most sacred of all mountains of the Inca, and planted in the ice, removed and carried back down to inform and empower the community um, for another year. And as the sun comes up, the crosses come down and make their way back. Um, and, and down below in the valley, there are thousands of people kneeling in prayer with all eyes on the summit. Well, when the first people reached the shores of Australia, they went walking and over time established 10,000 clan territories like a cultural matrix over this most parsimonious of, of continents. Um, and as the Aboriginal people today trace the song lines, the tracks that the ancestors made at the dawn of time when they sang the world into being, the path of the rainbow serpent, they enter the dream time, which is neither a dream nor the measure of the passage of time. It is the very realm of the ancestors, a parallel universe where the ordinary laws of time, space, and motion do not apply. There is not one of the 10,000 languages of Australia that had a word for past, present, or future, and not one that had a word for time. To walk the song lines is to become part of the ongoing creation of the world, a place that both exists and is still being formed. 
Thus, the Aboriginal people are not just attached to the earth, they are essential to its existence. And without the land, they would die, but without the people, the earth would wither. Should the ritual stop, the voices fall silent, all would be lost. Everything on earth is held together by the song lines, just as everything is subordinate to the dreaming, which is constant but ever-changing. Every landmark is wedded to a memory of its origins, yet always in the process of being born. Every animal and object resonates with the pulse of an ancient event while still being dreamed into being. The land is encoded in everything that has ever been, everything that ever will be, in every dimension of reality. So the world is perfect, yet constantly being renewed. So to walk the land and honor the song lines is to engage in a constant act of affirmation, a kind of endless dance of creation. Well, when you think of India, the British always claimed that India did not exist until they brought in a post office and a railroad and a set of hotels. The truth is India for 7,000 years has been one vast mandala of the sacred. For thousands of years, the landscape of the entire subcontinent has been defined and given meaning by the power of myth, narrative, and pilgrimage. On any given day, today included, there are tens of millions of acolytes on the move, making their way step by step through a living landscape of mountains, rivers, forests, and villages, all elaborately linked to the legends of the Hindu gods. Every place has its story, as the great a scholar, Deanna Eck, writes, and every story has its place. And what the pilgrims ultimately are looking for are points of illumination, sacred destinations known in India as Tirthas, or a little bit like the thin places in, in Ireland, you know, where heaven and earth comes together on a regular basis to reveal glimpses of the divine. But in India, they become portals to crossing places charged with power and purity, um, where the devotee can cross from the realm of samsara to reach the far shore of liberation. And India, of course, is a land of 10,000 tirthas. Well, as we sort of touched upon today, the most profound cultural insight of the Bhattasana and the Makuna is the idea that people and plants and animals are one and the same. Mythology infuses life with meaning. Ritual reinforces the norms that drive social behavior. There is no separation between nature and culture. Without the forest and the rivers, humans would perish. But without people, the natural world would have no order or meaning. All would be chaos. And maintaining the flow of generative energy, fomenting reciprocity among all forms of life, uh, is a duty of the shaman. And the shaman moves with ease through mystical dimensions unseen by ordinary eyes, but familiar to the Barasana and Makuna, who claim that they see with their minds. And so in these incredible ritual ceremonies that embrace the entire community, the men ingest yahe, and then they don the ritual regalia, the yellow corona of pure thought, the white egret plumes of the rain. And they literally, as I said today, they become the ancestors reliving the mythic journeys, alighting in all the sacred sites, transforming and transcending every form, becoming as of a single pulse of pure energy flowing through all of creation. In the homeland of the Arawakos, they really do believe that their prayers maintain the cosmic balance of the world. 500 years after Columbus, these people still look down on the beaches where he arrived on his third voyage. They still are ruled by a ritual priesthood. The training for the priesthood involves 18 years in the shadowy world of darkness, where the acolyte is taught in a world in which existence is only an abstraction. And after 18 years of this, he is led out on a pilgrimage to the heart of the world. And for the first time in his life, he sees the beauty of the world. He sees a horizon. He sees a mountain range. And the priest who trains him as he takes him from the sacred hut to the mountains and from the mountains back to the sea is constantly saying, you see, it's as I've promised you, the world is that beautiful. I've been telling you all these years, it's yours to protect. And these rituals are still going on. This is a good friend of mine, Mama Camilo, who I'll be with in a month. I was with him two weeks ago. And he said something very profound. He said, La paz no vale nada si es solo, solamente una manera en que los varios lados del conflicto pueden unificarse para mantener una guerra contra la naturaleza. 
peace won't matter if it's just an excuse for the various sides to come together and maintain a war against nature. We have to make peace with the natural world. And Colombia is such an incredible country that makes it, it opens to the possibility that two days after this happened, I was on the presidential jet and Juan Manuel Santos was preparing his speech for Namasimake and I interrupted him and said, for the mamos, datos no vale nada. You have to speak from your heart. And he used that message to his speech for the whole nation. So, you know, if we go for a moment to my income, maybe I became an anthropologist because of where I was born. This is where I live, um, in the homeland of the, the Taltan. And I had a, jobs like park ranger and hunting guide. And in the course of my, my wanderings, um, I had to map this, the biggest wilderness park in British Columbia. And my job description, uh, it was a job only our socialist government could have created. It was a wilderness assessment in public relations. And in two four-month seasons, I saw 10 people. So there was no one to relate publicly to. And I, I just wandered. And I came, I ended up, it's a long story, but I ended up getting to know this wonderful Gitsan elder who was 43 years old before he had sustained contact with white people. Remember that until the building of the Panama Canal, uh, the w northwest coast of North America was about as far from Europe as you could get. So at a time when the Amazon had been explored for 400 years, and Montreal was entering the third century, Captain Vancouver had not reached the Northwest Coast. And I, I began recording what would become almost 40 years of myths from him of, of Weekett, the trickster transformer, kind of like Coyote or Raven. And these are all stories of moral gratitude played out against landscape. You know, he spoke seven languages and did so with care. Uh, he would never say you can't kill an animal because a hunter kills to live, but he'd say you can't suffer an animal because that involves humiliation. And I asked him once about this cycle of tales, and um, he said that his, he had asked his father how long it was, and to find out, they had put on snowshoes in March month, the time of good ice, and begun to walk all the way to the end of Bear Lake. And he said, all the way there, all the way back, story not halfway done. <laughs> and, then, and then his... Um, I said, well, what happened when the black robes came, the missionaries, right? And uh, he said his father was an open-minded man, so he said to the missionary, well, tell me about this place you call heaven. Well, it's kind of white. Everybody's got wings. They really get along. It's very nice. Well, what kind of animal you got up there? And, you know, and they didn't cry. He said, so you got no wolf. Uh, caribou got to be doing pretty good. <laughs> and then suddenly it dawned on Alex's father that heaven was a place where the black robes didn't allow animals. He said, you gotta be fucking crazy. I mean, you, I, can't, I can't drink, I can't mess around on my woman, I can't do swear, I can't do all the things that makes life fun to go to a place where you don't allow animals. You, you can forget about it. Um, <laughs> and and uh, um, so each of these stories, if you will, um, these cultural anecdotes, they're all rooted in place, and they're the product of a particular way of thinking, a kind of unique vision of life itself. But they all express a universal and common impulse, this fundamental human desire to engage not death, but life as it is, the invisible forces that lie all around us, the realm of the imaginal in the here and now. Death, of course, is the great mystery, the edge beyond which life as we know it ends and wonder begins, and how a people rationalize that inexorable separation determines their religious worldview. When it comes down to it, most religious ideology is all about wrestling with eternity and trying to come out on top. Um, but stripped to the bone, that's what they are. But critically, the pursuit and embrace of the sacred, by contrast, has nothing to do with um, death, it's all about life. Because the sacred is eternal. It reaches far into the past, shining as a beacon to the future. It is everywhere and nowhere. What is sacred can never be diluted or compromised, co-opted or copied, commodified or made sordid through commerce and greed. Sensed, if never seen, elusive and mysterious by its very nature, the sacred may lie beyond are reached, yet there's comfort just in knowing that such a radiant presence may one day be encountered. The clock is not ticking. No force exists that can rob us of its promise. The traveler today walks the same spiritual ground as the pilgrim of old. Freya Stark crossed the desert in search of lands and peoples where 
the miraculous, she wrote, is not yet separated from everyday life. Patrick Lee Fearmore witnessed the efficacy of prayer whilst living in a remote Benedictine monastery perched on a rocky summit in Greece. It had little to do with religion, he concluded. Prayer's power to heal was a product of desire. No matter how often we declare sacred experiences to be unverifiable, wrote the anthropologist Clifford Gertz, it does not stop people everywhere from having them. So when I was a boy, still in the thrall of my Christian faith, my, my father, without being in any way unkind, gently dismissed all religion as wishful thinking. Every church he quipped ought to have a billboard outside of it with the cautionary words, important if true. Uh, and, and perhaps he was right, but the pursuit of the sacred, as I discovered long ago, has nothing to do with religion. It is not concerned with what lies beyond death. It makes, in fact, no claims on anything at all. The sacred embodies and radiates the glory of what exists in this moment, on this blue jewel of a planet. Before the Buddha or Jesus spoke, wrote D.H. Lawrence, the nightingale sang. And long after the words of Jesus and Buddha are gone, the nightingale will still sing. The goal of the pilgrim, he added, was to become as if a bird, dissolved in the sky, yet feel, filling heaven and earth with song. Think about that. Passing through the sky, leaving no trace, at one with the sacred. Thank you. I've got one more really lucky um, thing to do. Um, you know, somebody here was giving out um, presents left and right, and it's like Christmas. He's like the little boy who didn't get one. And uh, there's someone here who I've known a very long time, uh, who I respect in so many ways, not the least of his ability to keep his luminous brother anchored to reality for a <laughs> while. And Dennis, uh, you know, authenticity is my favorite word. Uh, and there's few people I know who are as decent, honest, and true and authentic as Dennis McKenna. And he's brought us here, and thanks to the organizers, we have one goblet for you. Thank you, thank you, Wade. Thank everybody here. This is this is really more than I can really speak to. I'm a little. I think the term is gobsmacked. Uh, it's just been an honor for me to work with everyone. I have some of the the people in this room are among my closest friends, and I would say Wade, and Luis Eduardo, and Michael, and Christina, and Donna, and Paul, and uh, Mark, and everybody here are, I guess, part of my personal history. And I just am so blessed to have known you all, been able to work with all of you. This will continue. Life is good. Thank you for coming. Thank for your support and your sincere 
Well, thank you for your love. Thank you. Thank you.